So in the three plus years or so that, that I've been here, it's kind of been a, a running joke about what hat is Gary wearing today. Sometimes we used to say when I was doing the dual associate pastor facilities director role, if I had shorts on, I was facilities. If I had pants on, I was pastor, right? So, but in, in that, that, that blessing of wearing hats, I wear the facilities hat, I wear the pastor hat. I am super blessed to wear the husband hat. And one of my favorite hats is the dad hat, right? I get to be a dad. And sometimes what's funny about the dad hat is it looks a whole lot like a referee cap. Because when you have seven kids, you're bound to have some conflicts. There's, there's always going to be some squabbles and disagreements. And, and over the, the 30 years or so that I've been a full-time professional dad, I can say we've, we've had a few doozies of, of, of arguments between the kids, right? And these, these disagreements, most of the time in our house, they were over something silly. It might have been a piece of clothing. Somebody, somebody took my shirt. It might have been uh, candy right after Halloween. Those were some big ones. But a lot of the times it was over food. And I don't know if they thought with nine people in the house we were going to run out of food, but we didn't. We never did. But it takes a lot of food to feed a family of nine. And because of this we had an extra refrigerator in the laundry room. Now, the, the, the main refrigerator, the, the main fridge and the kitchen, that was where all the regular food was. That's where, you know, all the stuff you needed to make dinner or grab a snack or have a glass of milk or whatever. But the fridge in our laundry room was known as the dibs fridge. And we called it the dibs fridge because that's where the extra stuff went. That's where if it was a leftover piece of pizza from your, from your dinner, you could put your name on it, call dibs, put it in the dibs fridge, and it was yours, and nobody else could touch it. And that worked whether it was a pizza, or if one of the older kids went out to dinner with their friends, or with us, and they had a leftover box, they could put their, their name on it, right? And it was good to go. It was safe in the dibs fridge. Well, this dibs fridge turned out to be the epicenter of some of the most classic battles in our home. And I'm not going to name names, but uh, if I do, I have to give the kid a dollar or something, something like that. So, but we had more than one child that was guilty of being hungry, sneaking into the dibs fridge, eating somebody else's pizza, or whatever it was, and leaving the box there thinking they'll never notice, I guess. I don't know. But then when the, the, the child that dibsed that particular food item would come back to the fridge, they would open their box and find it was empty, and that's when chaos broke out. That's when the finger pointing and the name calling and then the shouting and the screaming and often led to banging on each other's doors and saying things that weren't real kind to their siblings. And that's where the referee came in. Put on the referee hat, blow the whistle, step in, get to the bottom of what's going on, and assess the penalty. Ten yards for unsportsmanlike eating of a cupcake. But conflict, it's not always as simple as kids in a dibs fridge. Conflict within us has been going on since the beginning of humanity. And that's what James is talking about today as we step into chapter 4 and we, we continue in our series, True North. We talk about submissions or struggles and submissions as we dig into chapter 4. Let's, let's hear what James writes. He says, what is the source of conflict among you? What is the source of your disputes? Don't they come from your cravings that are at war in your own lives? You long for something you don't have, so you commit murder. 
You are jealous for something you can't get. So you struggle and fight. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and you don't have because you ask with evil intentions to waste it on your own cravings. Last week, at the end of chapter 3, James was talking about wisdom. And he, and he opens this chapter continuing that theme, but the wisdom that he's talking about is, is the wisdom that drives us. It's the wisdom that makes us tick. And James has talked about using the right words and saying the right things and then, then having the wisdom to, to put them into action. And James is always writing about putting our beliefs into action. And here James is, is saying that our, that our actions are not always good. And we have conflicts and disputes amongst ourselves. And it's almost always because we want something that's not ours. This desire, this, this wanting is because we, we crave something that's wrong. And he says, you ask and you don't have because you ask wrongly. And some translations say we don't have because we don't ask God. And when we do, we have the wrong motivations. We ask to fulfill our emptiness with personal pleasures instead of asking God to fill our hearts with God and the Holy Spirit. And we find ourselves trying to fill this space that God created within us with things of the world instead of praying for God to fill us. And this is true whether you're wanting your sibling's cupcake. It's true whether you're wanting to destroy your neighbor's land. And it's true when you want to have power over someone else. Because when we set out to destroy our neighbor, we are in no way loving our neighbor. And we are going against the very will of God. And James goes on to say, You unfaithful people, don't you know that friendship with the world means hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy? Or do you suppose that scripture is meaningless? Doesn't God long for our faithfulness in the life he has given us? Here James calls the readers unfaithful. In other translations, he says, you adulterous people. And he, he calls them adulterous because essentially they're cheating on God. They should be reaching out to God and, and, and calling on God to, to fulfill their every need, but instead they're looking elsewhere outside of this relationship for that satisfaction. And they're looking for personal pleasures and personal gains to satisfy their own needs. Instead of looking for the things that, that God uses to fulfill them. The Old Testament uses this, this adultery language when, when the people of God rebel and they set up false idols to worship. James is saying that they can't have both. We can't have both. They can't be faithful to the ways of the world, the, the evil parts of the world, and still be faithful to God. The two don't go together. But the good news is that even when we are unfaithful, God is there for us. In verse 6, he continues, he says, But he gives us more grace. This is why it says, God stands against the proud but favors the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. 
Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cry out in sorrow. Mourn and weep. Let your laughter become mourning and your joy become sadness. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. The New Revised Standard Version says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And this is James. This is James quoting Proverbs 3.34. You see, God sets a really high standard for love. But God also sets an even higher standard for the way God gives us grace. And the beautiful thing in this verse is, even though we've rejected God, God still gives us grace. Even when we've, we've chosen all the other stuff above God, even when we, we, we create our own altars, God still says, come home and I will give you grace. We receive grace upon grace upon grace, even when we have rejected God. But God keeps giving grace to those who humble themselves and admit that, that God is what matters. And yet God still opposes those who live in their pride. For us, this looks a lot like living into our baptismal vows when we resist evil in whatever forms it presents itself and we move closer to the love of Christ. And James says to submit to God. He says, stop bossing God around, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you no matter how hard you've resisted, no matter how hard you've fought God, and no matter how many times you've argued with God, no matter how far you've run to escape the call that God has placed on your life, God will show you grace. And God will still use you. And the goal here is, it's not to argue better, to prove that you're right and that others are wrong, or especially to prove that God is wrong. The, the, the goal here is to, to humble ourselves, to admit that we've fallen short, to pray for the things that, that God cares about, to acknowledge our sinfulness, and to receive God's grace. I spent... Most of my life, arguing, fighting, and running from God. And as a, a young person, I told God, hey, we're good. I didn't think that I needed Jesus in my life. I knew he existed, but I didn't know him. And as an adult, once I did know him, I didn't have time. I didn't have money or the willpower or the willingness to follow the calling that God had placed on my life. There was a time when I was asked to help lead a youth mission trip, and I didn't want to give up my time off from work. So I said no. And you've heard this story before, but there was a little pink sticky note that one of my daughters left on my computer that changed my life made me realize what was important. And as I got older, God told me that I was called to tell others about God. And I dug in my heels hard for a long time because I didn't want to give up my home and my career and all my stuff, all my belongings that I'd worked so hard for to become a pastor. And I soon discovered that, that God is much more persuasive than I am stubborn. Amen. And I eventually surrendered and I humbled myself and I, I recognized that God meant more than all of those things. And when I did, God gave me more grace than I could ever imagine. And looking back, I wonder, what was I thinking? I wasn't. I was living in my pride. My conflict wasn't with my neighbor. My conflict was with God. Verses 11 and 12, James acknowledges that, that we will have disagreements with one another, and he, he issues this warning. He says, brothers and sisters, don't say evil things about each other. Whoever insults or criticizes a brother or sister insults and criticizes the law. 
If you find fault with the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge over it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, and he is able to save and destroy. But you who judge your neighbor, who are you? James is getting back to the point that he's been making all along. These, these people, they're, they're, they're speaking badly of one another and they're, they're slandering each other and they're judging them way too harshly. And he sounds a lot like Jesus from Matthew 7, 1 or, or Paul in Romans 2, 1 where he says, when we judge others, we condemn ourselves. So we should leave the judging to God. After all, who do we think we are when we name ourselves the judge. Remember that, that James is calling on us to use the wisdom of, of putting our faith and our words into action. And we are called to love God and love one another. And Jesus himself says that these are the greatest two commandments. And to break these is to break the law. Because I don't know if you know this, but love is a verb. Love is not passive. Love is not a thing that you can put in a box and set on a shelf. Love is an action word. And love is the action that James is calling us to do. It's what God is calling us to do. The point is about doing what God wants and not what we want. James continues in verse 13. It says, pay attention. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town, we will stay there a year buying and selling and making a profit. You don't really know about tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for only a short while before it vanishes. Here's what you ought to say. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast and brag. And all such things, all such boasting is evil. So James turns his attention here to the, to the upper class of the time. People with the, the freedom to, to move about, to make money. These were the folks that probably felt they were a little bit better than everyone else. And perhaps even a little bit above the law. But James tells them that they're, they're nothing more than a mist. They're prominent now, but their importance can dissipate like the wisp of a cloud in the wind. And their pride enables their arrogance. And they, they make plans about things that they, they have no control over. And what they should be saying is, if the Lord wills, I will live this way. And if not, their living is considered to be boasting because they're, they're not living under the guidance of God. They're not living in submission to God. And it's, it's not always intentional defiance. Sometimes we live as if God doesn't exist. We go about our day-to-day our -day routines without thinking a lot about what God wants and we make plans based on our own hopes and dreams without, without even thinking about God. We may be living a really good life, but we're, we're not responding to God's daily guidance. And when we do this, our pride and desires point back to verses 1 through 12. And it's about what we want to do. And it's about what we desire instead of what God desires for us. And this desire that we have has two parts. And the first thing is we need to recognize the sovereignty of God. And the second is recognizing that it's not my desire, but it's yours, Lord. And that brings us to the final verse in this chapter. It is a sin when someone knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. It's a sin when someone knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. James doesn't kid around. 
James gets to the point. That's why I love James. He says, if we know what we're supposed to do and we fail to do it, it's a sin. Simple. When we ask God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And then we get the answer and we say, <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing that. We are refusing to do God's will. And this, this is a sin of neglect. This isn't me as a small child going to my mom and saying, yeah, I really don't want to clean my room today, mom. This is me as a child going to my mom and saying, I am not cleaning my room. It's a big difference. James is all about doing rather than just talking, right? James is about the wisdom of knowing what is right and taking action. And when we rebel against taking action, we refuse to be the hands and the heart of Jesus in the world. When we revolt against the idea of loving our neighbors, it's the same thing as revolting against God. But we all have a choice. We can either live independent of God or we can live our lives dependent upon the God that, uh, a God that knows us, the God that created us, the God that loves us so intently and so intensely. Where will you move closer to God in your life? I want you to ask yourself, what is the one thing I can do this week to move closer to God because God jealously, jealously longs for a closer relationship with you. It's your move.